Welcome back, everyone. I, had, I hope you had a nice break. Um, all right, so we have three speakers now. Army and JCTB. Um, okay, so starting off, we have Colonel Stuart Cree. Colonel Cree is the Director of Training Systems for the Australian Army, where he is responsible for analysing, developing and modernising the Army training system. In this role, he also serves as the Program Director for Army's Future Ready Training System Program, ensuring Army transforms to meet the challenges of workforce and capability generation into the future. Colonel Cree is an armoured cavalry officer with experience across tank, cavalry, aviation, engineer and headquarter units. He has operational deployments to East Timor, Afghanistan and Iraq and has also served in the United Kingdom and the United States. Colonel Cree has enjoyed postings as the commanding officer, chief instructor at the School of Armour, as an instructor at the Australian Command and Staff College, as the lead designer for major exercises in the Directorate of Joint Land Collective Training, and as the Deputy Director for International Engagement Army. Colonel Cree's current portfolio also includes an appointment as the multinational lead for training within the American, British, Canadian, Australian and New Zealand ABC ANZ Army's program. He holds a Bachelor of Science, a Graduate Diploma in Military Technology, and Master's Degree in Strategy and Policy, as well as International Relations. Thank you, Colonel Cree. Uh, thanks, uh, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation um, for uh, both Josh and I to present here today. Uh, I'm going to run through, um, the way we'll do the brief is I'm going to run through where Army is thinking uh, about its uh, training systems for the future, what that actually means for Army writ large, and then uh, Josh uh, will follow on with the sort of deeper dive into what does that really mean, where we're at with some of the simulation um, uh, pieces. Uh, having had that wonderful, <laughs> uh, uh, extensive um, uh, introduction, I'm also conscious that uh, Josh has a bio that reads very similar to mine, actually. Um, yeah, he and I were in, in some of those same places at the same time uh, throughout. Uh, and also, Josh has the great distinction of, like me, having been a CEO of the School of Armour. Um, I'm not sure whether you're going to intro him now, or do you want to intro him now? Uh, and then we'll both... Oh, are, you, are you presenting together, or...? Yeah, yeah, we'll present together. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's hear about Josh as well, because it's equally as exciting. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. So... So Colonel Joshua Gilman, um, Colonel Gilman started his military life as an armoured cavalryman and has filled a range of command and operations appointments within that specialty. He has built a, a subspecialty in training, simulation and experimentation through postings to the US Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, Army Experimentation and as commander of the Australian School of Armour. He is now the Director of Land Training Capability within Army Headquarters. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, and look, uh, on behalf of, uh, of Josh um, I just, and myself, I just thanks very much for the invitation. Looking forward to uh, being able to answer some questions at the back end as well. Uh, and I'll just run through um, my brief. There's a bit to cover, but it sets the, the example. I know, I know there's a lot of people uh, more broadly uh, in this community and wider who are really interested to know where we're thinking about taking training into the future. And so uh, that's where we'll, uh, we'll run with the first part of this brief. The Future Ready Training System, which is a program we established or initiated about two years ago uh, when we first proposed the requirements for it as we look to the future. And that's what we're working through at the moment. But if we just, uh, now the slides aren't uh, great, uh, but hopefully we'll find them more workable as we roll our, almost literally roll our way through. Um, so if we just go to the next slide, please. Uh, so you should be essentially seeing one that uh, talks about the, the changing strategic environment. Uh, and uh, Josh, you just need to hit read uh, control H. Uh, okay, so thank you. So this, the strategic environment is changing. And what does that actually mean for our uh, Army's training system and the implications for it? We appreciate that as we see uh, the broader shape, deter, respond guidance that we're, uh, we're we've received from government you know, back to the department. What does that mean for Army's training system? We know that it means we need to be more scalable. We need to be more resilient. Uh, much of our training system I would offer, which was built in the 90s uh, or largely based in the 90s and a geostrategic view of, um, of the 90s uh, versus the one now, the situation has definitely changed. And so our system has to actually change with it. And so we see a greater demand for scalability and resilience across uh, Army's training system so that we can respond to crisis uh, more appropriately. 
We also see that we, we all appreciate that in the case of Army, there's a large recapitalization of Army's equipment sets uh, in the coming decade. Uh, our uh, other services, Navy and Air Force, are, are going through that process now, and Army is about to initiate really uh, in earnest. The first major piece I would offer from a, perhaps a black hat vice point of view is the recovery of vehicles now here, but there's a lot more coming in the next decade. And so there's a great opportunity for us to rethink about how we need to do our training. But we know we need to be more agile and we know we need to be more joint integrated for the joint force. So many of our capabilities that are coming uh, through the force structure plan have a great joint interdependency in our workforce, in the skilling required to operate all those uh, pieces of equipment uh, and capabilities and how they integrate. And so that changes the way we need to, to think about some of the service silos that potentially have existed uh, in the past. Um, we also know from a broader requirement uh, that we, we know we need to be sustainable. Uh, yeah, that's a, a given for all organizations, but, but we need to make sure that we're designed for that continuous improvement uh, through the and meet the broader requirements uh, of, of the department from a transformational strategy point of view. And then in, in really importantly, sort of Army's thinking and deductions that come out and implications that come out of, uh, of some of that uh, changing strategic environment analysis. We appreciate things like accelerated warfare, which is Army's thinking about the future and its future statement about what the uh, future horizon uh, looks like from a war fighting point of view, especially in the land domain. Uh, and we know that if we're to operate and succeed in that uh, hyper increasingly accelerated or hyper accelerated environment, what does that actually mean for the way we need to train our people? Things are going to be changing rapidly and we need to make sure that we're tra training our people uh, in, the, uh, as good so in that good soldiering piece, but also to make sure that they can thrive in those complex um, operating environments. It's only going to become more complex uh, and we only need to look at our own daily lives to realise that, let alone what it might mean from a uh, operating environment point of view. Uh, equally, when we then look at what does that actually mean as we get into the sort of uh, grassroots sort of bit, our, our training system has to be able to generate combat ready teams that is ready now, but also potentially ready for the future. But we've got to be able to do it in the constraints that we're given by both time and resources. It's one thing to sort of be able to do a whole lot of stuff in with the resources, but in the premise of that accelerated warfare construct, we're short of time. Uh, and so uh, reduced strategic warning times. Uh, we don't have time to raise a Kitchener's army to then commit to battle. And so how do we make sure that we can do those broader pieces that we can be scalable, resilient, and all the way through to the time constraints and resource constraints that actually exist. Uh, and so that's, that's part of the broader change as we look at the changing strategic environment and what it actually means for army uh, uh, writ large. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so you should be seeing a slide that's titled Accelerated Warfare. And, 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 and the, the, the key byline here is that from an army, it, people are our most important capability. The collective for a large group of people is an army. Uh, and so people are our most important capability. Platforms will come and go. Vehicles, whatever kind of kit we might issue, will come and go. But it's the people who will actually win the day. And so when we look at what accelerated warfare means and the, the compressed timelines uh, and that things are now happening at a faster rate than what our current systems are built for. So we have to change the way we actually do business in order to uh, uh, meet those uh, requirements. We've got, to change, we've got to change the way or transform the way we think about doing business as well and, and think about how we do training. And that's a, uh, that's a really hard proposition itself for Army to, there, you know, there are some things that we've been doing for a long time that we've really well mastered and now we're sort of having to change the game. And so that's a real challenge from an organizational and a change management point of view. Uh, but as the accelerated pieces come, then the things that we have always done aren't necessarily, they may still be valid, but we can't do them fast enough. We can't do them well enough. And so what have we got to do to actually change the way we think about uh, doing that business? And then as, as that last point about Army are our competitive, Army's people are our competitive advantage. And it's not just how well they can do something like drive a tank, it's actually how we've got to integrate and orchestrate all of these capabilities uh, to achieve the collective um, uh, capability. So, you know, we, we are in Army, a, a team of teams and part of the joint team as well. Integration is such a critical piece to everything that we train. You know, it's one thing, as I said, we can train someone to drive a tank but a, a combat team at the point of battle is bringing a whole lot of things together. So how do we do all that when we've got all this different new equipment, we've got a changing dynamic around us, 
these all present significant challenges for how we need to be able to train into the future. And especially when some of the capabilities we've got may have classification issues, uh, may have operating expense issues, uh, and uh, there were just the, the normal time constraints that might exist. How do we achieve the level of mastery in the orchestration and integration is actually probably the bigger challenge than just how we get someone qualified to do their singular job, but how do we actually qualify the team to do the, uh, the bit of, uh, bigger uh, job that's required of the team at whatever scale the team might be? Um, from, you know, from down to soldier up to general, you know, what, what is that gonna need to look like? So if we go to the next um, slide, thanks. Um, so the slide's titled Future A Training System and the Organizing the Functions. We've done a lot of work over the last year or two, and some of you probably be uh, aware of, of how we've been thinking our way through some of the problems that we, and challenges that we see. There's problems with our current system, but challenges that are being presented by the future. And this is really just a, we, we know that the Army Training System is a highly complex adaptive system. Uh, and to be able to reduce it to a couple of graphics on a single slide uh, uh, is really hard to do, um, but we've given it a crack uh, nonetheless. But really it comes down to you know, how do we make sure we get the right strategic guidance, we govern the system, we can resource it, organize it, access the training, whether it be individuals, people, teams, uh, the army itself, how do, how do we get a continuous accessible learning system that allows those individuals to be uh, go through learning and development to achieve mastery in whatever role they may have. As I said, whether it be a tank driver or the combat team or battle group commander or the brigade commander or the brigade staff, how do we make sure they can access the training and get, um, get the learning and development and experiential development that is necessary to achieve that mastery? Uh, and then equally, the really important part here about those functions is how do we inform our future? So that last bit on the right is really a, a key part of, of our thinking about the functions of our future retraining system, about how we actually achieve ready now. Because the rest of the things we, you could argue we sort of do already to achieve ready now, if we keep doing what we've always done. But how do we make sure we are uh, focused on um, being ready for our future as opposed to necessarily just ready for today? And I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit of detail in a moment. So if we go to the next slide, uh, look, I won't, I won't dwell on this. It's in the pack that it will be made available to you or for those who wish. But essentially our program design, which, take, you know, which is really about how we organize ourselves to achieve this into the future. And we're running with essentially three LOEs. One's about our training continuum. How do we get that accessible, relevant learning and development opportunities for our people wherever they are? How do we train at the point of need uh, throughout? The next part is in those training environments. How do we make it realistic, repeatable and measurable? Uh, and so that we get that enhanced team performance uh, and the right environments. Our environment is changing. Uh, as much as Josh and I might love Puckapunyal and driving around in tanks in Puckapunyal, there's not too many areas that we're operating in that actually look like Puckapunyal. Uh, they look a lot more like Marawi or Mosul. Uh, you know, they're increasingly urban. Uh, in 2019, for the uh, first time, the majority of the Indo-Pacific uh, population in the Indo-Pacific is now in an urban environment. Uh, we also appreciate that our region is heavily uh, littoral. And so again, how do we make sure that urban littoral environment is a critical piece because that's such a hard operating environment. How do we make it realistic? The other piece as well is there are so many things going on in our, uh, in our uh, operating environment that just going out and practicing driving around Puckapunyal is sort of okay, or Shoalwater Bay or Coltana, wherever it might be. But how do we replicate or make realistic or relevant when we see threats or existence like swarming uh, UASs, as a, as a singular example. How are we gonna generate that kind of training and make our people comfortable with the idea that they are being uh, not necessarily overwhelmed, but uh, that there are lots of things coming at them because it's such a complex, congested, connected environment. So we've got to be able to give them those experiences that enable that to occur. And so that, that's how they're going to be able to thrive. That should be normal for them. They should be what, what other people might see as being overwhelmed. Our people should be able to turn around and say, this is just another day at the office and I know what I've got to do. Uh, the last piece is then about our architecture. And this is really some of the stuff that we're driving through at the moment because we actually have to change our whole business model in order to set ourselves up for the decades ahead. It's one thing, and I use the sort of Netflix and blockbuster analogy sometimes at this point, because 
it's one thing to sort of turn around and be able to say, I want to be able to stream all the stuff, but uh, you've got to change the business model. And that's partly what that LOA3 is about. How do we change our business model in the analogy of going from a blockbuster to a Netflix? That's, that's what we're trying to do through our transformation. So I'll go to the next uh, slide. Uh, okay, so there's a couple of big ticket items uh, just that are outlaid here that we're trying to work our way through really over the decade. Because although we can turn around and say the transformation will take about four or five years, we'll probably achieve the bulk of it, but there's some really big ticket items that will take some time because uh, we are talking about some significant infrastructure changes and, and uh, posture changes, et cetera. The first piece here in that LOE one is about our learning design uh, initiatives and our human performance optimization. And some of you will have seen as we are working our way through at the various training centers across Army, about how we do better blended learning, better technology enabled learning, uh, better use of simulation, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then on that third line down there is about the home station training piece, because as we try and make it more accessible, how do we make that training, that learning and other bits and pieces, including education, how do we make those bits more accessible to where our people are? Instead of bringing them back to the blockbuster of Pakapanyul or Kanangra, how do we actually get uh, get it out to where they are and get it to the get it to, get it to the people uh, who need it when they need it to the point of need? Uh, some of you will be familiar as well with some of the work we might be doing with date and and, and training uh, our way through the adversary and what that adversary looks like and our simulation systems need to help create that uh, that reflects the modern adversary, and that's what date uh, does um, does for us. Uh, and look, I'll, I will uh, cover the, uh, down towards the bottom is some of the C2 changes that we are, we're trying to make to better set the conditions and enable the right training and learning systems to be in place across the enterprise. So we'll go to the next piece and I'll just quickly run through these things because I'm conscious of time and uh, Josh has got a few things that you'll want to hear uh, in detail about. All this is is just to say, hey, we're, we're making some changes within TRADOC uh, at Army at the moment where we're shifting a couple of the branches to Canberra so they better integrate. My replacement next year, Colonel Nathan Pierpoint, he is just moving to Canberra right now uh, and he will be integrated, well integrated into future land warfare. Because it's one thing to turn around and say, how do we think about fighting in the future? We've also got to be thinking about how do we then train for it into the future? And that's part of our bigger challenge that we're trying to address through this FRTS is what does that all mean as we think about even the force posture implications uh, back into our training system? Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, the uh, broader reorganization of our training enterprise. What we're doing is we're looking to the future and thinking how do people, how will people learn in Australia in 2030 and beyond? Because we're an army from the community. We're an army in the community. And so what we've got to be able to make sure we're doing is recognizing that society's changed. And COVID has been a really great exemplar of that. It, the way people at the broader community are thinking about the future of work will actually the great resignation or whatever the people are maybe predicting that are going to occur in the next few months. But what, what does that actually necessarily mean for our own people who might be looking at coming to army and then going back into industry and then coming back? We know the workforce dynamics are changing. So how are we got to actually reorganize ourselves to have that um, same alignment? We, you know, people no longer join any organization, including army for a 30 year horizon. They join for four or five years or less and go to somewhere else. And then that, that's the future of, of our nation. Uh, equally, the science and technology aspects is a national problem. The army is a microcosm of that, but we, we need to adjust to, to meet that same um, challenge. Equally, uh, as we look at the, de the department operating model, the idea of a single service is doing their own thing is increasing, increasingly in our past. So what have we got to do to reorganize our training centers to better reflect the fact that most of it, so many of our trades uh, and skills are actually joint applicable. Uh, and then we've been doing a whole lot of work uh, internal to Army to understand what the current hurt state or current state uh, actually is and where we need to be. So we are going through a process at the moment of thinking about how we will reorganize our training centers for the decades ahead. Uh, and look, that might mean that we end up in sort of two colleges, a land combat college and a trades college or something, but I don't think we'll see the training centers uh, as we know them uh, exist into the years ahead because uh, the system itself, uh, the, the, the situation has changed and we need to change with it to meet our future. So the next slide is really a part that uh, you'll probably be a bit more interested in is how we've got to be informing our training system. The Battle Lab is a, is a concept that we are developing inside Army at the moment about how do we bridge the gap between the current force and the future force. Future Land Warfare will be thinking about 
uh, how we need to operate in the years ahead. We've got to be thinking about how do we then provide that environment, that experimentation environment that allows our people on a more accessible manner to be able to uh, experiment with innovation, experiment in a simulated or a synthetic training environment where they can try different tactics, different techniques, different procedures, and do all these different things and work out, hey, if there's a new uh, piece of innovation that has appeared, whether it be in our own side or the adversary side, what have we got to be able to do? How do we, how do we, how do we run our way through all this sort of stuff to work out what's the best way of, uh, of regaining or at least gaining the initiative and retaining the initiative? So the Battle Lab's a really important piece about how we've got to think about our LVC into the future because that's where we've got to be able to do that experimentation. Okay, next um, slide. And then, uh, okay, so look, here's a few things that I've already essentially touched on that we're, that we're really sort of working our way through at the moment and making great progress on date as our adversary system is really important because it actually focuses us on what we need to be training for and what we've got to be able to train to beat. And if I turn around and said date in an urban environment, how do we train to beat date in an urban environment is like working a uh, I look at the Australian Rugby Union uh, headquarters across the road from uh, me here at Victoria Barracks in Sydney, and they must spend every day working out how they're going to beat the All Blacks. They still haven't cracked that yet. Um, good luck. Uh, but we should be thinking about how do you beat date in urban because that's 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 the high bar. That's the high watermark. That's what we've got to be actually gearing ourselves for. And using simulation is going to be critical for all of that. Home station training is obviously a really big piece, and I know that Josh will talk to some of these things about how that all needs to come together. Uh, in more detail, but it's a really critical component of our future. Uh, and we're doing a whole bunch of things that are listed there. Um, uh, as we think our way through how we're going to be able to enable that uh, in a broad geographic challenge as well across the nation. But we've got to be really conscious that in Army, we've got soldiers in Townsville, Tamworth and Tasmania. All of them deserve the best training we can give them. Uh, and so you know, we've got to make sure we're just not focusing on where there might be a couple of critical nodes, but across the broader uh, network that is Army. I've touched a little bit on contemporary learning and how we need to be able to bring that right balance between using technology enabled learning systems uh, and how we can use simulation better uh, and how we can develop the right experiential learning pieces as well uh, at that point in need. Distributed driver training is a really good example of some of the changes we're making structurally. So we've established uh, driver training nodes in Amberley, Townsville and Darwin. We've been partnered um, with, um, uh, with a provider uh, help to help us provide uh, key driver training in those uh, locations. And we're leaving the uniform staff to focus on the tactical employment. So we will use uh, contracted workforce to help us with the licensing in those key locations. Uh, and we will do a greater um, uniformed investment into the tactical employment side. So we're already making changes where the School of Transport now has all these nodes around the country. And when you start to map that with uh, the home station training concepts, you know, we're already moving in this direction. Uh, so some of the stuff I'm talking about isn't where we'd like to be. We're actually moving on these things now. And we're really working hard to develop more meaningful partnerships across industry. Now, I'm sure that there'll probably, probably be some people online uh, who will uh, either firsthand um, know that that's what we're doing or have certainly observed uh, the increasing partnership uh, that we're, partnerships that we are developing to enhance our training system. And then the last slide that I'll, I'll cover, which is just a, a simple example of our, uh, some changes that we have made that sort of bring a number of these things together. So the Army School of Logistics, uh, uh, Logistic Operations, ASLO, based in um, Bandiana. Historically, people came uh, down to Bandiana for four weeks of training. That's the blockbuster thing. They came down to blockbuster for four weeks, did a whole bunch of stuff. We're now able to give them a lot of the preliminary work by getting it uh, distributed, uh, whether it be online or through virtual means. Uh, and then we're able to bring them into, um, uh, into the uh, synthetic training environment and be able to have them do uh, all the synthetic tactical training actually at their home station, in their, in their unit, with the team they're actually going to be deploying with or, or ready to go and fight with. So it's much better to learn with the team you're actually going to deploy with than a whole bunch of strangers that have come together in Bandiana for four weeks to do it. Better to do it with your team. Uh, and then better for your supervisor in that team to know the strengths and weaknesses of each of the team because they've gone through the same training mechanisms as well. Uh, and so, but that was all enabled by ASLO. 
So Aslo didn't step out of the system, but they did it all and enabled it all, but enabled it to occur at the point of need. So it's a really good uh, example of, of where we're able to get to. We're there now, but we've got to bring the rest. There's a thousand courses in Army. This is just one. Uh, and so that's essentially where we're at at the moment. Uh, I realize that's been a, a bit of a rapid fire through a whole bunch of strategic um, down to sort of the, the tactical um, pieces that we're working our way through at, at the army level about how we need to be able to make these changes for our training system. And so I'll, I'll pause there and hand over to Josh to now sort of do the deeper dive into uh, some of the uh, broader examples that, that his team specifically are working on that I'm sure will really sort of tease out um, and contextualize some of the things that I've spoken to. So I'll pause there and let Josh bring up the next part and then we'll be able to uh, enter into some discussion and Q&A at the back end. Sorry, Thanks. Colonel Gilman, um, roughly yeah. how long are you expecting to present for? We've got about five minutes for your piece because we need to give uh, Mr. Ron some time. I, 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 can, I can do it in five. Let's, uh, let's do that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, you, you've heard most of the, uh, the context from Stu and the future direction of where we're headed. Uh, the context in delivering these systems to enable it is, uh, is really relevant in, in our space. So in the previous paradigm, we've had uh, bespoke simulators delivered by uh, capability projects, all running their own software licenses and uh, integratable, but with much uh, difficulty. We've had ad hoc networks that you've had to establish and integration has been difficult. The current paradigm sees army projects and capability delivering over a billion dollars in simulation investment across the decade. This problem is increasing exponentially, uh, including spiraling cost of ownership for high-end uh, land-based capabilities. And, uh, and, it's, and you heard Stu's desire for repeatable measurable uh, training outcomes. Uh, just as important is the safety and security uh, precluding full rollout of our capability in the domestic sense. So we must leverage uh, our synthetic training systems if we're to get uh, training value out of our future system. And uh, the future and where we're going, Stu's just described most of it, but in order to enable it, we're going to need a coherent and, uh, and future design that is effective and efficient in SIM delivery. And, uh, and the efficiency really comes through that integration piece. So uh, here's how we're gonna do it. In, in, in terms of meeting Stu's vision for the future ready training system, it's essentially going to be delivered through uh, the establishment of a persistent land simulation system that is governed by integrating architectures uh, that, that will seek to assure uh, effective, efficient and habitual live virtual constructive training at all levels. Uh, you'll see in the middle of this diagram the uh, persistent land simulation system and significant touch points and interfaces that enable us to conduct land-based combined arms training, joint enabled land-based training, and just as importantly, is land contributions into the joint collective space. And you'll hear about that, uh, the CCMC shortly. Uh, land Simulation Core 2.0 as a wave top for those who aren't uh, already tracking, uh, is an army miners project that will deliver the software, the data, the networks and services uh, that will provide the backbone to this persistent land sim system. Uh, and again, we won't go into detail there and we're currently in tender for the first tranche of that. Uh, most notably though, uh, most of Army's training is conducted at the protected level. So the persistent land simulation system is predominantly delivering into that protected system. So the governing architectures, uh, we've already released the Australian, uh, the Australian Generic Simulation Architecture or GCMA. And this is our means of articulating uh, common standards and protocols that, that we've advertised out to our industry partners to conform to in delivery of future uh, high-end simulators and simulation. Uh, this has been successfully received by industry. And as you said, that, that $1 billion of investment over the decade is all set to align themselves with this GCMA, which will make them integrated by design from the day of delivery. Uh, and the subsets you'll see there are the delivery of the software, the, the use of the common software suite for maximized reuse of data, and delivery of the managed uh, land simulation network that will host uh, all of this. And uh, the last piece I wanna cover is just uh, work that we are doing now on the preparation for the generic training and, or targets of training range architecture, the GTRA. So under the same intent that we've used for GCMA, 
Uh, we've commenced to work with our industry partners on the design of a generic training and range architecture. This largely governs the standards and integration for our live training systems, which include, as you can see there, uh, range operating systems, targetry systems, and instrumented live training. Uh, this architecture will support a more open and uh, readily integratable system to enable a plug and play environment for capability bricks, regardless of OEM. And we'll see uh, efficiency in our operating and costs through life of our system. So together with GCMA, these two plug together to form a, a future framework under which our home station training uh, readily integrates all of our training enablers for live, virtual and constructive at all levels uh, to deliver that LVC training effect and design. So that, that's all I needed to cover in terms of how we're going about enabling the vision that Stu articulated. So I'll throw over to questions. Um, what I might do is I'll leave the questions for the uh, for the whole panel at the end, and we'll just um, hand over to to Mr. Ronfeld. Um, I'll I'll introduce him, and then we'll make you know some some time for questions if that's okay. Sure. Right, David Ronfeld is the deputy director of JCT Plans and Policy for the HQ Jock Seven J Seven Joint Collective Training Branch. He has thirty year background in the modelling, simulation, and military operations. He has a wide range of experience from simulation technician software programming and standards development. Previously Vice Chair of CISO Standards Activity Committee and Chair of the Enumerations Group and currently the Australian Lead to the NATO Modelling and Simulation Group. Thank you, Mr. Ronfeld. And um, good morning all. Um, and the slides will come up shortly. Um, but yeah, as those of you that have been around a while, um, I'm probably a well-known face. Um, so, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity to, to present here again. Um, as it says there, I am part of the J7 out of uh, HQ Jock. Um, and yeah, our mandate is to train the joint, war for, war, joint force for warfighting. So next slide, please. Um, I will give a very, very, very brief JCTB update, um, which is so uh, on the current situation. Uh, we have been a bit quiet because of COVID, um, but the main focus here is to give you information on how we are looking to provide um, support for the experimentation and to everybody else for the inter interoperability side of things. Um, the big part of that that I want to get out there is the work we're doing with, with NATO um, and the availability for um, other defence members and also industry to get involved and then we're talking about interoperability. Um, I will give a brief CISO update um, because that is a very critical part of uh, the standards and, and processes internationally um, that will then form part of our um, efforts to, to improve interoperability. So next slide, please. So I'm not going to repeat. Uh, JCTB hasn't um, actually moved. There's no major updates at this stage. So it's going to be very, very brief. Um, Look, we are still here. We are the delivery of JCT, which is Joint Collective Training Events and Exercises. So we go across the all uh, the five domains, land, air, sea, space, information. Um, big part of that is as well, um, it's not on this slide, but we are helping integrate the um, CSIMC solution uh, alongside CIG, Joint Capability Group. And we've now started to integrate uh, and we will include ADF HQ, uh, force integration division uh, as they take over a bigger role um, but that's all coming into the next year so we'll go to that. Uh, the big part of what I do uh, in our area is we're looking at the capability development um, for joint collective training environment so we are looking um, outside the, the current operational cycle so we're looking four plus years out um, information that is going to be coming in um, that will become critical for our joint interoperability so uh, our remit is to get after that and a large part of that is our engagement um, with the international community so this does include NATO modeling and sim group uh, coalition partners um, and another one we haven't done this year because of COVID is uh, out to industry and users is we do still chair the simulation environment working group so I will tag this one here just to let everyone know it does still run uh, we're planning on one for the first quarter for 20 22. Uh, so watch this space. If you want to know more about the SUG, uh, my details are on the, on the front slide of this so people can um, actually contact us. 
but yes, the it will be reinvigorated now that um, we're slowly working our way out of COVID. So next slide, please. Now here's where I'll be giving you a very brief update of where the NATO Modeling and Simulation Group is currently at. Um, I am the Australian lead. Uh, I've just come back into the role. I was away for 18 months um, and we are definitely on a big push to get this reinvigorated because it's where not just us uh, as Australia, this is where the international partners, NATO, the US, a lot of all the tools we currently use and everything else have actually been developed by this group. Um, that's why it's actually important um, that we do bring it up. It is an underutilized tool we, we have had um, available to us. So next slide, please. Now that all change. Um, yes, yeah, so here is the, it's, it's basically an update on the current position and, and the work that's been going on. Um, next slide, please. As you know, it's, it is a very, very active and worldwide uh, organization, even though it is done uh, out of NATO. Um, as you can see there, there's 22 member nations of NATO, but there's actually eight partner nations, uh, which does include Australia, New Zealand, um, and we're bringing more online as more people um, start getting, getting involved. So it is a very good opportunity for, for development for uh, coalition and interoperability to support modeling and simulation. Um, and Australia is actually a well-represented well member. We've been there since pretty much the, the start of this. Um, and we are a well-recognized and well-supported um, member of, of this group. So next slide, please. Okay, um, as you guys, well, some people will be aware, um, they have actually a very big federated mission network um, that backbones all of this work um, involved. So uh, how the NATO modeling and sim group work, we actually break up into individual working groups with, um, with tasks and, and set deadlines and expectations. So, um, you know, there's various different working groups that go along. And if we bring just down at the bottom there, it's MSG 193. So they're actually in the process at the moment of re-looking at how we are going to improve and keep up um, the, the existing mission networks. And that, as I said, goes beyond NATO because this does fall into the US uh, training networks, the UK training networks and everything else. So, and our current um, D10, is actually modeled off this as well. And the new future core simulation capability will be taking a lot of um, information from this as well. So next slide. Uh, the recent efforts that they've actually been involved with, um, there's a lot of work happening at the moment for cyber events, as everyone's probably aware. So the whole community has been contributing towards uh, a lot of the development work for the new HLA forms. Uh, there is a CISO, which we'll get to in the next part, uh, CyberDem, um, information that's coming out. Um, the work of that is then going to become adopted as NATO standard, but I will talk to CISO's interoperability and engagement with um, NATO modeling and SIM uh, in the current slide, uh, in the future slides coming up. So another group um, that they're working on is modeling and SIM as a service. As everyone knows, that's becoming more and more uh, relevant and, and required. Uh, and it's been long running. That's been a multiple year effort, uh, multiple different working groups, but they are actually getting to, to finalize stages. They've had some good testing out of NATO um, and some of the, the um, outcomes have now been adopted and there will be starting to get some architecture in behind here uh, that will become published as a NATO standard as well. Um, and also out of SISO once it gets that way. So next slide, thanks. Um, the newest efforts, um, there's some work on composable human behavior in constructive simulation. Uh, that's going to become more and more prevalent as we move on into the, the future. Uh, we need a lot more of this. Um, it will help us in our, in our training um, and everything else. So, and dynamic messenger, so NATO's ASW, which is on, uh, yes, yeah, ASW, yep. <laughs> um, Anti-submarine warfare. So this relates to some of our previous um, speakers, especially from the Navy. We do actually have some involvement uh, with NATO in this already with the Australian Navy. So that's good. And they're coming out to um, try to improve that uh, interoperability again in the click training. Next slide. And of course, the whole idea of all this is we are aiming for interoperability by design. And I think that's been brought up 
by all the other speakers. We, we have to have it by design. We can't now add it later on because uh, we've learned our lessons from, from years ago where we didn't have our interoperability by design. Um, and there's a lot of work going on. Digital twins is a big one now, um, is becoming more, more relevant. So it starts from the capability development side all the way through to mission rehearsal and delivery. Um, and we have groups involved at all stages in this, so uh, within the NATO groups. So next slide, thanks. Um, same thing, if you need more information, um, contact me about this if you want to know more about the NATO Modeling and Sim Group. And it does include industry. There is a lot of industry engagement um, in this area. Um, we're currently working with um, DST. We have previously worked with, with Talos um, on this. But there is an opportunity for Australian industry to actually get more involved uh, in these groups. And same thing, if you need more information, uh, my contact details were on the first slide. Uh, give me, give me a, a call on that one. So now we'll go on to the SISO presentation. So next slide, thanks. Um, yeah, next slide. So uh, for those, that, those of you that don't know, um, there is an organization. Um, it's predominantly based out of the US, but it is a multinational organization. Uh, they're just there, the headquarters is out of the States and we'll get into some of the history of that later. Um, but it is a recognized standards development organization. Uh, so a lot of the standards, as we'll get there, um, uh, have actually been done and developed by this group of people. So next slide, thanks. Okay, what SISO does, as it says there, um, they develop, maintain modeling simulation standards and we need to promote it. We need to be using it uh, because of course, if, if you don't get involved, um, yeah, you're, you're, you're gonna be behind. So next slide, thanks. I won't go through them word for word. Um, look, it is, the whole mission is to advance um, MS technologies and practices. They're a wonderful group of people to be involved with. I've been involved with them now for 15 years. Yeah, next slide as well, thanks. Um, and go to the next slide. These are just on the pack because I am gonna reduce the time. Now, for those of you who don't know, SISO has been around, uh, it was originally from the DISC, uh, workshops in the 90s when I was first involved with them um, and it formed out of the with funding and assistance from the US Defense Modeling and Simulation Office um, and it was formed in 1997 as an not-for-profit not for um, corporation. Um, they do have currently uh, 500 individual members. Um, it does fluctuate a little bit but it's, it's pretty consistent um, and we do get sponsorship from various organizations and government agencies. Um, they hold one big workshop a year. Um, we are keeping it uh, with a sub-virtual um, remote uh, function now because it has been successful. So for those of us in Australia where um, the travel is a bit of a, an issue in the past, um, they are keeping the virtual components alive as well as the face-to-face. -face. But I've been to a couple of the face-to-faces and it's a good opportunity for networking and for learning places like that. So we've got another one. It'll be, it's always in February now in Orlando in Florida. So if you want to go and um, it's beautiful there at that time of year. I wouldn't like to go in the middle of summer, but yeah, February in Florida is wonderful. So next page, thanks. <clears throat> Should probably skip over this one. It is a registered organization. It is run properly, but it's not not for profit uh, organization as well. So uh, if you want to know more about it, same thing, um, either look on the website or contact me. Um, the main thing, I have actually been previously the one of the chairs to the Stance Activity Committee. Uh, it was a great experience um, and we proved that we can run a chair from an organisation from other countries apart from the US. So it was a wonderful opportunity. So next slide. Um, whoop, yep, whoop, that's the one, IEEE. Um, as you know, the DIS HLA standards um, and DSIP uh, very well known with modeling and simulation uh, to let, to improve interoperability. They are an IEEE standard, but all the work was done out of SISO. So IEEE recognizes SISO as the, the committee or the CSI standards committee. Um, so we are the, the, the leaders of that. Uh, the good thing about becoming a SISO member, by the way, as well, people, um, you can actually download the standards, um, one copy each for, for, for the cost of your membership. Um, so that's something to think of. Um, let's plug the membership. Done. Next one. Uh, they are affiliated, as I said, with NATO Modeling and Sim Group. This is where they, they do actually align very, very well. So a lot of the development work, um, implementation 
experimentation that's proven or work is done by the NATO Modeling and Sim Group. Um, and because then you want to take these um, ideas, um, applications, architectures, standards um, to the next step, um, they have did the agreement way back in tw uh, 2007 with uh, SISO to turn the work into actually official standards. Um, they also work, SISO work with European Training Simulation, um, NATO Modeling and Sim, IETEC as it says down there. Uh, we do have an affiliation as well with um, Simulation Australasia. So um, that's our link back here into Australia. Next slide, thanks. <clears throat> the good thing about the SISO products, um, they are available all free of charge on the website. The links will, will work off this presentation. So if you are looking for the information, um, it's all there available for us, apart from the IEEE ones, where if your membership, that's the only ones that, that aren't available for free, but there's a lot of other standards products. Modeling and Simmons as a service coming out of one. Uh, UCAT for the Army is another one that's actually um, done by um, SISO. Uh, C2 Sim, which is a new one that's just been released, that's very critical. Um, that's now available as well. Um, enumerations, I think anyone that's ever been involved in simulation has used enumerations. All of the enumerations baselines are actually based from the SISO enumerations. Um, so yeah, it's definitely worthwhile getting involved. Um, and same thing, these don't cost anything to download and utilize. So next page, thanks. Um, current activities, uh, there's a Link 16 sim simulation standard coming out, um, Web LVC, uh, which is actually gonna become more critical um, as we, we go toward the cloud. It does form part of your modeling and sim as a service. Uh, a good one for, for us as Australia that we need to be aware of, uh, especially with our fifth generation platforms, CDIS, which is a compressed disk standard is coming out. Um, it should be released next year. It's currently in the balloting stages as an official standard. So um, I know Wing Commander Tully was talking about um, being involved in some of the exercises over there in the US. Um, that was actually developed from the US and because they understand the, the need for interoperability, the CD standard has fallen out of that one. So, um, which is why now we'll be able to get hold of it. We'll be able to tell our, our suppliers that we, we, you know, we can utilize CDIS. Cyber, as I said, is already there. Um, a new one is simulation interoperability readiness levels. It's something uh, we should look at as the Commonwealth um, to start putting that in. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's actually quite a good one. It's, it's owning the initial part of it, but it will give you some confidence that your simulations you are purchasing will have some interoperability readiness out of, out of, the, out of the box. Um, there's new study groups. Um, XR standards, which is um, uh, extended reality. We've, there's some, a lot of war very, very active simulation and wargaming study group. Um, so what these are is a group of people, normally organizations that have got together and gone, look, potentially there might be a uh, worthwhile effort to, to standardize how we're going to do it. So before it turns into a standard, they start with a study group. Um, so cloud-based modeling and simulation is another study group that's actually falling out of the modeling and sim as a service um, coming out of NATO. So next slide. Um, current activities, heavily involved with NATO activities, um, strangely enough. Um, they, have, If you're interested in um, the simulation exploration experience, that's a lot to do with, they're looking at space and, and how they, they work with space and development. It is a very, very interesting one. Um, something where Australia, I think, could definitely um, get value of into the future. Um, and there is new uh, websites and infrastructure because nothing ever stays the same. So uh, just watch the space, check out the standards one. This should be my last slide, I think. Next one. And that's it. We will go now go to questions because I noticed the time we are running out. So that was a very, very brief, quick update. So thank you very much, Fred. Over to you. Thanks, David. Um, all right, great. We, we're into lunchtime, but I'd, I'd like to squeeze in just one question, actually, if we can have the time for that. Um, to Colonel Cree, so you mentioned earlier the need to be more agile with our training systems and everything else, which was a well-made point. Um, you mentioned earlier also that you know we're we're facing a changing geopolitical situation. 
And I guess, you know, behind that is the fact that there's been quite a, a significant concentration of um, army and, and the other defence forces, of course, as well, um, towards, you know, support of, of our coalition partners um, and overseas deployments and this sort of thing. And now we're moving more towards something which seems to be a little bit more from going from the asymmetric to the symmetric again um, with these, with these you know, large state actors. Um, and I, I would presume that it's, you know, that, that's a trend that's actually going to swap back and forth quite a lot. So I can imagine that the challenge for, for defence in, in acquiring the right kind of capability blend and balance, uh, that, that's a big problem and, and it makes the problem even more difficult for training. Um, and like I say, you, you, you said that there's, there's a bit of an agile sort of approach that you're taking to that, but have you, have you observed or have you, you seen anything that, that is sort of a, a very specific direct change to army training that needs to happen based on these changing circumstances? Yeah, I think if you look at the nature of the uh, strategic guidance we've got and you look at the nature of the capability investment that the government is making in land power, uh, I think that there is a way that, that parts of the nation are looking at the challenges ahead. Uh, if you look at our recent history, it looks different to probably our nearer horizon. Uh, and so it does provide, there is a sort of constant pendulum. That's also the adversary. When the adversary sees you go one way, they start to go the other. Yep. Um, and so that's a natural, I think that's a natural part of the system. And that's why we need to be agile because we just need to be able to adjust. But I think if we build the right training system, the right system of systems, then we provide the best platform for our people. You know, the training system is our most important platform. We'll get new tanks, we'll get new helicopters, we'll get new guns. That, that stuff will come and go and change, but it's our people who will always remain the center of our, of our capability and so what we've got to be able to do is give them the right education and training that allows them to deal with whatever comes next that's how do we build the right agile systems that actually put people at the center of all that um, so that we we optimize their performance and we optimize the team performance um, because whatever happens on any given day uh, and you know josh and i have, have been in some of those places as well where you wake up one morning thinking something's going to happen in an operation and it goes completely pear-shaped in a different way. And you've just got to be able to then deal with it, thrive with it, adjust it. And that's what we've got to be able to have with our people in order to whatever the uh, threat or environment is that we find ourselves um, uh, having to operate in or against. Mm. We've just got to be able to bring them uh, those opportunities where they can thrive no matter what. And that's the real challenge for Army is that we've got to be able to generate uh, and train and develop our people to thrive in the most abnormal and adverse of circumstances. Mm. Uh, and, and that's that's the nature of the challenge. Thank you, yeah, great answer. Um, I'll just, um, I'd, Fred, yeah. I'd just like to add something to that as well. Um, and I totally agree. Um, it's, it's, it's not just our equipment. Um, people are a big part of our, of our next generational platforms. Um, so we have to train as we fight, uh, which does include, we have to look at new new systems new, the people the way people work um and are taught and are ready to be educated are different to how they were you know five ten years ago so mm -hmm. to me it's not just fifth generation platforms we talk about people um form part of our fifth, fifth now into sixth generation platforms mm -hmm. yeah yeah very true all right we'll have to close it off there um and let everyone go off to lunch so um let's close here and we're back at one o'clock um, we have the student presentations and a masterclass running on after action review and debrief. So um, please come back to your uh, choice at one o'clock Sydney time. Thank you, gentlemen, and appreciate your time.